Hello, everybody. So two weeks ago, I interviewed a former professor of mine, Dr. Danushige Michishita, about how he sees world politics from over here in Japan. Some of his answers rather surprised me, and his analysis is not exactly the same as mine, but I'm not here to reaffirm my own biases all the time. So I was grateful to hear how he as an experienced realist thinker and policy planner interprets what's going on in this complicated corner of the world. With this said, please enjoy the interview. Hello everybody, this is Pascal from Neutrality Studies and today I have the very great pleasure of talking to a former professor of mine and one of Japan's top experts on security strategy and foreign policy. I've got with me Professor Narushige Michishita of the Tokyo-based National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, where I did my MA and PhD. Professor Michishita is now also a vice president of the institute, uh, actually the one that you can see right behind him. Mm. Um, he, he is a member of the board and a program director. Uh, he got his PhD from the Johns Hopkins University, and he's one of Japan's very internationally minded security scholars with perfect English. Dr. Michishita is definitely a realist, keeping a very close eye on military capabilities of different actors. And he's first and foremost a great North Korea expert, speaking fluently Korean. He has written numerous books and articles on North Korea, hence I asked him to please talk to us about the recent developments here in Northeast Asia after President Vladimir Putin's visit to Pyongyang and Professor Michishta kindly accepted. Professor, great seeing you again. Thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction and the kind invitation, Pasco. Uh, good to be with you. Um, I wanted to talk to you very much because on this channel, I haven't had a lot of chances to actually also explore Japan's security situation. And in the last couple of weeks, I believe a lot has changed because of this new relationship between Russia and uh, and North Korea. Um, how are you interpreting what happened there with Vladimir Putin's visit um, and also the this new security treaty that was created, which doesn't include anymore an article on Korean reunification and also Kim Jong-un's dropping and official pronouncements that they're, they don't want to reunify anymore, that they know where their southern border is. How do you make sense of this, looking at it from Japan? Yeah, so... Um... This uh, recent uh, rapprochement or improvement of uh, relations uh, between Russia and North Korea results from two considerations. One is tactical, the other strategic. Uh, tactical consideration is certainly Russia is, uh, you know, uh, involved in this war in Ukraine, and uh, it gets uh, it's getting prolonged, and uh, Russia needs ammunition, uh, missiles, and other war fighting materials. And the North Korea uh, can serve as a convenient uh, supplier of uh, those materials that uh, Russia needed to continue war in Ukraine. So, uh, and North Koreans are very happy. You know, they can export their, uh, you know, um, arms, make money, obtain food and energy from Russia. You know, Russia cannot uh, export energy too well, so. North Korea can get, uh, you know, a fairly good amount of energy uh, at uh, very uh, low prices, I guess. And uh, certainly um, this uh, partnership and symbolic, uh, you know, improvement of relations uh, with uh, one of the great powers in the world is a blessing to uh, Kim, um, North Korea and especially uh, for uh, its leader, Kim Jong-un. And another aspect, uh, which is uh, more strategic, is that Russia, what's Russia doing, what's uh, North Korea doing, and, and also what uh, China is doing, uh, they are trying to kind of stand up against the current uh, international uh, order, which is from their perspective dominated uh, by the Western countries such as the United States and uh, advanced uh, countries in Europe. Uh, including uh, Switzerland, uh, your country. Uh, but uh, um, so in order to resist and uh, say no to this, uh, you know, order, uh, traditional prevailing order in the current world, 
they are sort of uh, working together and uh, uh, in order to undermine the credibility of the current order, which is led by Western countries. So um, I would say, as I, you know, uh, based on these uh, two big considerations, uh, Russia and uh, North Korea are, because, you know, coming close together. Um, yes, the and this clo coming closer together uh, didn't that just happen two weeks ago, right? Um, uh, Kim Jong Un had already visited Russia, uh, Moscow, like nine months ago, and especially the treaty that well, they did, forged. He didn't visit Moscow. He went uh, with uh, Putin in the what, Far Eastern. Yeah. Sorry, you're right. You're right. Yeah. You're right. Mm -hmm. uh, and some North Korean. Uh, top uh, level uh, officials, they went to Moscow. Oh, yeah. and mm -hmm. It, it took right. about nine months to now create this new uh, treaty between them, which Vladimir mm -hmm. Putin actually said is nothing new. It's just uh, an updated version <laughs> of an old Soviet North Korean treaty. Mm -hmm. um, what do you make out of this treaty? Did you did you look at it, the, the, the provisions that it has? Do you think it changes the strategic uh, balance in the region? Yeah, so I'm... Um kind of uh, of the uh, opinion that uh, this um, treaty uh, between Russia and North Korea uh, is more of a, the product of a, I mean, symbolic. Uh, it, it has a more a, of a symbolic uh, product or has a symbol, symbolic value than uh, real world uh, significant physical you know uh, significance why because uh, as you said um, North Korea and Russia had already been working together right Russia was providing uh, uh, necessary food um, energy and other probably military technologies to North Korea in return for North Korea's uh, supply of um, ammunition and uh, missiles to Russia so, uh, they are there already. And uh, I mean, if you take a look at the treaty and read it, uh, they say a lot of things. I mean, they, you know, say that uh, North Korea, if North Korea is attacked by somebody else, Russia should uh, intervene and help North Korea and uh, vice versa. But realistically, um, nobody would like to attack North Korea, right? <laughs> nobody would like to attack uh, Russia. Um, so it's it's really uh, more of a symbolic, and uh, you can see how you know um, Russia. I would say Putin was not too enthusiastic about his visit to Pyongyang, whereas Kim Kim Jong Un was so happy when Putin visited uh, Pyongyang because you know Putin arrived in Pyongyang three I don't know three hours later than expected. Uh, leaving Kim Jong-un waiting at, late at night in the airport uh, in Pyongyang. And uh, it was an embarrassment in a way. Uh, but uh, still, I mean, Kim, Kim Jong-un welcomed him, smiling, you know, big hug and all that. Uh, so I, I think, uh, you know, being isolated and uh, being under sanctions, uh, uh, imposed by the United Nations Security Council resolution, as well as other unilateral sanctions imposed by other countries such as the US, South Korea, and Japan. Um, you know, North Korea would like to, I mean, Kim Jong-un would like to sort of show uh, to his people and to the world how, you know, uh, he is still engaged uh, in world affairs in, uh, you know, as a one of the most important leaders of the world and uh, how he has a uh, friends and allies, um, uh, you know, in different different places in the world. In a way, uh, I mean, North Korea is in a very difficult position, you know, it's under um, sanctions and uh, its economy is not doing well. Uh, recently, uh, you know, one of its uh, closest friends, uh, and uh, Cuba, decided to normalize uh, diplomatic relations with uh, South Korea, North Korea's uh, sworn enemy, right? That was a big disgrace uh, for um, North Korea. So in order to kind of push back um, and uh, you know, still 
can show to the world that how well <laughs> uh, North Korea can do and is doing. Um, Kim Jong really wanted uh, to have Putin over to in Pyongyang. Now, in connection with this change of rhetoric in North Korea, that they are not seeking reunification anymore and actually ask the South Koreans not to try to forcefully reunite either. Do you think this will this this is going to change the way that politics is going to happen between the two? Are we now closer or further away of a maybe a peace treaty? They The two are still in an armistice, right? But are we getting closer to a peace treaty? So important, interesting point, and uh, this is you know point is actually related to the previous point that I made, which is uh, you know South, North Korea is uh, on the defensive, and the North Korea is in a very weak position, especially vis-a-vis -vis South Korea. South Korea is doing very well economically, militarily. Uh, you know the size of uh, South Korea's economy is uh, six, 60 times as large as North Korea's, uh, South Korea, um, you know, spends, you know, we we talk about uh, uh, North Korea's military buildup, but if you compare um, defense expenditures of those uh, two countries, uh, South Korea actually spends 10 times as much on defense as North Korea. And, uh, you know, North South Korea has a twice as large population as uh, North Korea, so it's it's no comparison, and uh, you know when we talk about missiles, uh, we always talk about North Korean missiles. But the, if you count the number of missiles, South Korea has already uh, acquired more than one thousand missiles, which are is uh, you know larger in number uh, than that of North Korea. Only thing is, North Korea has nuclear weapons, whereas South Koreans don't. And uh, um, South North Korea has a long range missiles which can hit Japan or the United States, uh, whereas South Korean missiles are short range targeted mostly at uh, uh, North Korea. But I mean, South Korea is doing so well. And the South Korea last year, in terms of uh, this defense expenditure, South Korea was the uh, uh, 11th largest spender on defense in the world. And Japan was actually in the 10th place. So only one place down. And, uh, you know, so the two countries more or less spending more or less the same amount of money in, on defense, which is quite impressive, uh, given the fact that South Korea's population is uh, less than half uh, that of Japan. So North Korea is really uh, kind of uh, becoming more on the defensive, in my opinion, and and plus, um, recently, the North Korean leaders are getting more concerned about uh, penetration of North Korean society uh, by South Korean culture. You know, because uh, they are now uh, because of a uh, partly because of a uh, technological change. Uh, North Korean, you know, pop people in North Korea, especially in uh, urban areas, are uh, now um, have used smartphones, right? So if they put some, you know, plugins, it would be relatively easy for them to view uh, K-pop music, K-dramas, K-movies, and uh, you know that's uh, there are a lot of. And the plus, uh, it used to be like if you you are North Korean and if you want to watch uh, South Korean uh, dramas. You have to smuggle in the VCR video, big video tapes into your country, and that was a you know uh, uh, it's a long shot. But now all we have to do is to is to just bring in DVDs, very you know slim DVDs, then uh, USB, um, you know memory sticks, and then now SD cards. There, it's very easy. For you to smuggle them into North Korea, so now a large number of North Koreans are viewing, watching, uh, listening to South Korean dramas, movies, and music. And uh, so, interestingly, uh, North Korea in the past several years uh, enacted different uh, laws uh, in order to pro uh, prevent South Korean culture from coming into North Korea. So, in 2020. 
uh, North Korea uh, enacted a law entitled something like, uh, it's called something like uh, anti-reactionary um, culture law. And in 2023, it enacted another law, which was to uh, design to preserve Pyongyang standard language. What does it mean? So in 2020, North Korea, when you say anti, you know, reactionary culture, that's basically South Korean culture, American culture, right? So in 2020s, North Koreans were trying to prevent, uh, you know, South Korean cultural products or American cultural products from coming into North Korea. After three years in 2023, they, the situation had already been created where South Korean cultural, cultural products are in North Korea. And South, North Korea, especially young stars, started to use uh, words and expressions and intonation that the South Korean young stars use, right? So North Korean leaders noticed that and didn't like it. Therefore, they enacted this law to, you know, kind of preserve Pyongyang language, which is, uh, you know, uh, inst- uh, basically uh, from uh South Korean soul language, right? And uh, so it um, shows how desperate uh, that North Korean leaders are becoming in protecting their kind of, you know, ideological purity of uh, North you, Korean people. And, and and do you think that they, they are now forced to give that up, uh, looking at the fact that this kind of like, uh, being a hermit kingdom and and staying staying so super closed is is obviously failing because like in the treaty with Russia that actually includes uh, a joint economic zone and it includes uh, increase of tourism and and student exchange um, which surprised me a lot because you know North Korea didn't do that they didn't want their people to leave and now. Uh, it seems to me this is a first like real opening in terms of okay we are we open toward the right side <laughs> the ones that help us but opening will probably happen do you see it that way too yeah maybe uh, they might be happy to encourage uh like uh, inter more interactions between Russia and uh North Korea partly to divert their attention away from South Korean things toward like Chinese culture or Russian culture, which are, has a lot in common politically and ideologically with uh, North Korea's right culture and ideology. Right. So I don't know, but uh, that's uh, that can be uh, one interpretation of uh, what they are trying to do. Um, in and- any case, so why um, North Korea, as you said, in January this year, Kim Jong made a big long speech, and uh, in which he basically said, uh, you know, he would not pursue unification of the Korean Peninsula anymore, and that they are two different, uh, separate, uh, distinct uh, states in on the Korean Peninsula. One is called the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, which is North Korea, and the other one is the. Republic of Korea. He said it, you know, that's the official name of uh, South Korea. And uh, so why is he doing it? In my interpretation is that he, by kind of clarifying or, you know, clearly drawing a, a line between the two Koreas, he is trying to protect his country from uh, South Korean Things South Korea, South Korean political influence, South Korean cultural influence, and economic influence, even so. Um, that and about the so, I think basically North Korea is on the defensive at this point. But the question is, uh, will South North Korea become more like, a, um, how does it say, peace loving as a result? <laughs> But I'm a little uh, skeptical and uh, uh, no, I'm not too optimistic about it. North Korea sometimes try to use offensive means in to, you know, kind of for defensive purposes. So when they want to protect uh, themselves from South Korean culture, they use offensive means to, you know, uh, to like uh, 
you know, take uh, this military action, that military action, you know, so sending uh, dirty balloons to North, South Korea. Basically, what they are telling by sending balloons with, uh, you know, dirty trash, um, uh, you know, um, to South Korea, uh, North Koreans are trying to send a message. Don't mess with us, you know, don't uh, stop sending uh, this balloons, uh, you know, that the uh, North Korean defectors living in South Korea sending to North Korea with uh, you know a large number of uh, uh, you know memory sticks containing South Korean music, South Korean drama, South Korean movies, and all that. So or propaganda, anti Kim Jong propaganda materials. So they are saying, don't do it. If you keep doing it, I will punish you for that. So. For that, I mean, they are, now they are sending balloons, dirty balloons, but they might at some point start using military means of making, you know, saying that same thing. So I'm a uh, little concerned. I was recently in uh, in South Korea, and one of the things that um, my host there said is that in South Korea, everybody everybody expects reunification reunification is like an, a national she, she described it as a national religion and she said of course they're expecting that under the framework of the rok they're expecting mm -hmm. to korea to happen the same thing that happened to uh, germany where west germany ate up east germany right and that to me is a very legitimate security concern if i was north korean right i mean you would want this to stop so do you from the way that you see that that this is going do you see a chance that uh, south korea might might also accept okay fine for the time being let's accept that there's two korean states and and actually walk work towards a peace treaty so there are two um different opinions in south korea and uh, basically, say, um, the conservatives in South Korea tend to think that putting pressure on North Korea and uh, in order to bring about regime change or at least regime transformation in North Korea is the way to go. And uh, progressives uh, in South Korea tend to think that uh, accepting uh, the status quo and uh, peace for, you know, pursuit, pursuit of a peace uh, for uh, coexistence is the way to go. How, so, but uh, I mean, there are, you know, certainly um, like up, upside and downside to each uh, idea. So, you know, if you think it's a good idea to accept peaceful coexistence, with North Korea without putting too much pressure on North Korea. That's more or less what we try to do um, between, you know, when progressive government is in power in South Korea. But what happened? North Korea continued to develop nuclear weapons, uh, missiles, and uh, other military capabilities. They, you know, North Korea didn't stop. So is the question is, uh, you know, how peaceful Will, would the peaceful coexistence between the two Koreas uh, can be. And uh, so then the conservatives says, therefore we have to uh, keep putting pressure on North Korea and change its regime. Uh, certainly there is a point, but then if you put keep putting pressure on North Korea, North Korea might uh, get more defensive and, uh, you know, if cornered, uh, North Korea might lash out uh, and uh, do something bad in order to really prevent uh, North, uh, South Korea to put in from putting pressure on North Korea. So either way, they're upside and downside and I, you know, nobody can say which is uh, the best answer. So in this sense, is the new security treaty with Russia not rather a stabilizing element on the Korean peninsula? Because now North Korea has the written guarantee that if there should be an attack, it would get help. I mean, this if I was Kim Jong-un, this would put my mind quite a bit at peace. I, I don't have to rely only on deterrence. I mean, through the weapons, I can also rely on deterrence through my new alliance. And, and Kim Jong-un called it an alliance. Vladimir Putin didn't. <laughs> he didn't use the word alliance. Yeah, but I mean, I don't think the Russians uh, believe in paper. I don't think uh, North Koreans believe in a piece of paper, which is treaty. 
Whatever it says doesn't really matter in an extreme situation where North Korea is, you know, like a collapsing for one reason or another. And uh, I'm actually, you know, worried about uh, this treaty might uh, have provided a uh, convenient excuse for Russia to intervene on the Korean Peninsula if North Korea started to crumble, the North Korean regime started to crumble. So I don't know. <laughs> I'm a little skeptical about Russia trying to protect North Korea. Russia would uh, you know, help North Korea protect itself, um, no matter, you know, regardless of the piece of paper, if it's in Russia's interest, uh, you know, no, Russia would not defend North Korea, uh, you know, uh, regardless of uh, piece of paper treaty, uh, if it's not in Russia's national interest. So I don't really, uh, I don't think a treaty really matters. And um how do you how do you look at China? I mean China is kind of the third part in this in this game and for the last 30 years China has been um North Korea's last kind of lifeline and now suddenly it's another one as well. Um do you think this is a coordinated effort? Do you think the Chinese are happy about what is happening or just like merely accepting the fact? Uh, basically, China is saying, uh, you know, it's not, you know, Chinese are saying that they are not very happy about what's going on. But uh, in my opinion, uh, I think they are basically uh, happy about what's going on between Russia and North Korea, uh, you know, in a big picture. But uh, they might be a little upset on small details. Uh, what I mean by that is, uh, you know, um, if it's China, the rapprochement of uh, Russia and uh, North Korea, I would say, is producing uh, results which are favorable to China. Why? Because uh, uh, by helping uh, Russia continue the war effectively, North Korea is uh, helping Russia prolong the war in Ukraine, right? And uh, if the war in Ukraine is, as it goes on, uh, the war fatigue is getting more peri uh, kind of proliferating in the minds of the people in the Western countries, especially in uh, the US and European countries. And uh, that is, I think, is in China's interest. And uh, so that's a good thing, but, uh, uh, and also um, a attention, world's attention is uh, shifting away from Asia to Russia, right? So that's another, um, you know, kind of plus for China. But um, tactically speaking, well, I mean, because now Russia has North Korea and the North Korea has Russia as a, you know, stronger partner. So bargaining position of China's bargaining position vis-a-vis -vis Russia and vis-a-vis -vis North Korea has slightly declined or diminished or weakened, right? So that's, I think, is, uh, you know, like something that uh, China is a little bit upset about. Uh, but uh, in the big picture, I think uh, China is happy to see what's going on. You know, I found it very interesting that in this uh, treaty between uh, Russia and North Korea, there's one clause that says, if ever we have a problem with a third country, we will do nothing to undermine each other's position. And that third country must obviously be China. There's, <laughs> there's no other one. Well, but there's a clause in there that foresees. Yeah. Um, but let's maybe change a little bit also to Japan's position since uh, you're in Tokyo and 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 you have insight also into the security thinking of Japan. Uh, uh, is Japan perceiving the, de the development currently in Northeast Asia as becoming more dangerous? And uh, what 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 is Japan's greatest um, challenge at the moment? How, mm -hmm. And how, how, how does it approach it? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So... Um... Bad news is that uh, the war and conflict has become more widespread and uh, people are more kind of, in a way, accustomed to the world with, uh, you know, like a turbulent uh, world env environment, which is really um, unfortunate and uh, worrisome. 
but uh, uh, in a way, good news is Russia is down, right? Russia is really uh, kind of uh, you know losing its power, and as in all its forces are on the other side of Russia, right? Yeah. I mean, the the and ones that Russia used to be over here, based... they're gone now. Yeah, and the Russia is basically undermining its uh, power by wasting so many, so much. Uh, uh, you know, manpower, uh, military equipment, industrial capacity capabilities into the war in Ukraine, and uh, Russia will come out much, uh, much more weakened, right? So that can be a blessing for Japan. North Korea is well, uh, you know, Russia is helping North Korea, so it's a bad news. North Korea is uh, becoming a little more strengthened. Uh, and uh, maybe Kim Jong has might have become a little more emboldened uh, militarily and diplomatically. And uh, now we are talking about possible dialogue between uh, North Korea and Japan uh, in order to address uh, especially uh, abduction issue. Uh, there are these 17 abduction, I mean, uh, Japanese people have been abducted, uh, of which five have returned, but the other 12 are still in North Korea, and there can be more uh, abductees. And we have to sit down with the North Koreans and talk about those issues. But now, uh, backed by uh, Russia, North Korea has a better bargaining position. And... Uh, uh, if in terms of uh, peace and security across the Taiwan Strait, um, I'm a little more concerned about the situation because, uh, well, Russia is weakened, but if if you are a Chinese planner, if I'm a, a war a Chinese military planner, and if Xi Jinping uh, asked me to attack Taiwan tomorrow, I would definitely ask North Korea to create a crisis on the Korean Peninsula. Why? Because uh, the um, Taiwan, uh, the U.S. and Japan are there, you know, under the U.S. Alliance, Japan alliance is there to do two things. One is to defend South Korea and the other is to defend Taiwan. So if there is a crisis on the Korean Peninsula, it would be very difficult for the U.S. and Japan to devote uh, most of its forces to the contingency across the Taiwan Strait. We have to leave some forces for uh, to maintain stability uh, on the Korean Peninsula. So we'll be not be fighting, but uh, we have to take care of two theaters of operations instead of just one. If there is a crisis on the Korean Peninsula, um, the US and Japan should uh, you know, leave some forces for to maintain uh, peace and security on the Korean Peninsula, while we send forces to fight uh, or def defend Taiwan. So, if North Korea uh, has a better military uh, capabilities, that would make our life more difficult in our you know effort to defend Taiwan against Chinese attack. Which is one of the main reasons why I keep saying that a, a crisis around Taiwan, a war between China and the US over Taiwan, is actually kind of a worst case scenario for Japan, isn't it? I mean, Japan yeah. has every interest to keep that from happening. Yeah. Um, well, now, well, how... certainly, I mean, war on the Korean Peninsula is, would also be disastrous. The... So yes. those two uh, contingencies or possibilities are real concerns to, to us. How do you evaluate some of the political decisions that come from the U.S. Uh, regarding Taiwan? I mean, one was a year and a half ago, the Nancy Pelosi visit. And the other one is that now there are U.S. military advisors in Kinmen, in that tiny little island right in front of Shaman, like five kilometers or so. And that, to me, is a very escalatory move. Is that Does that worry um, Japanese strategists? Um, it's not. Uh, we are not escalating the situation. China has consistently escalated the situation, so we are only responding, and uh, we are responding in a very cautious uh, manner and non-escalatory manner. But then, China keeps escalating the situation, especially after uh, uh, Lai Chindo uh, became uh, president of Taiwan. So it's really unfortunate. Why I, 
you know, it's really unfortunate how to see how Mr. Xi Jinping is undermining China, undermining the peace and stability in this region. He's really isolating China uh, from the rest of the world by conducting this roof warrior diplomacy, coercive diplomacy, and, uh, you know, spending a large amount of uh, resources to military capabilities instead of uh, devoting larger amount of resources to more productive, cooperative, constructive efforts. At the same time, though, there was this recent meeting between Japan, South Korea and China, right? Uh, a summit meeting, which actually produced a very long, I think, 18 pages uh, document on where the three agree and how to how to structure international relations among them. And one of the one of the key issues is to keep up uh, stability and also keep communication lines going. So is Japan's strategy at, to at the same time, of course, support the U.S. allies uh, and at the on the other hand, try to try to still co cooperate as much as possible with with China. Yeah, of course. And uh, we are trying. I mean, there are a large amount, a number of people, uh, policymakers, specialists, uh, who really don't like what Mister Xi is doing, and they understand how he is undermining China. And uh, by the way, it has become popular, unfortunately, for countries' leaders uh, to say that they would uh, make their great uh, countries great again, and uh, come out and uh, start destroying their countries. It happened to in the U.S. It happened in Russia. It might happen to China and. Uh, North Korea, so that's really, really unfortunate. And uh, so, what we would like to do is to engage with uh, Chinese specialists, uh, policymakers, intellectuals as much as possible, keep them informed, and uh, you know, kind of create an environment. If political environment situation changes, uh, China can come back on a more um, you know constructive, uh, cooperative uh, track. At the same time, though, it seems that China is, is going this other route, right? Um, cooperating fiercely with BRICS and constructing new uh, new institutions, uh, including Development Bank. And, in, and we're going to have the Shanghai Cooperation Organization meeting, I think, right now or this weekend. Uh, and they seem to be working with other partners now and not care very much anymore about uh, that you know, economic integration with the United States after all the sanctions that have been levied on them. Um, does this influence Japan's policy as well of how to interact with that bloc? Well, so what Japan is trying to do is to, I mean, basically it is a good thing uh, for the world and for the region in the Pacific region, uh, you know, that uh, China is investing and uh, constructing necessary uh, infrastructure in the, the countries in the region, that's a plus, you know, that's a blessing. The only thing is uh, we have to make sure that, that, you know, the way that China handle those projects uh, that it, um, it's been managing are, you know, economically sound uh, and uh, politically neutral and mutually beneficial and all that, right? And uh, transparent. Uh, so, I mean, nothing is perfect, but the, and we have uh, the US, Japan, and, you know, uh, Australia and European countries have a tr tremendous experience and know how in terms of. Uh, uh, kind of organizing uh, uh, international development project in a constructive and mutually beneficial manner. So we keep putting pressure on the one hand and on China, and uh, and on the other hand, uh, try to work with the Chinese officials and uh, you know uh, NGOs in order to make those projects uh, more transparent and uh, more constructive. Do you think Japan can be a broker um, between the US and China in order to kind of balance the two? Uh, because Japan is obviously perceived as different from the US, although it's its strongest military ally in the Pacific. Do you see a role for Japan to actually try to mend fences as, uh, as much as possible? Or is that not Japan's role? Um, well, Japan will certainly try to do it, but uh, there is a limit because, I mean, they are engaged in great power a competition you know we we are not in that game really you know and uh 
And, and we are certainly, you know, siding with the U.S. in that game. So how can we be neutral in that? You know, it's impossible. Uh, but uh, I would say Japan and China has a long tradition, very tight knit uh, human um, network and economic uh, interactions. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are many Chinese, you know, specialists coming to Japan, we meet in different, you know, environment. They cannot speak up, right? But they have their own ideas. And the, most of them are very reasonable. They understand what's going on, how China is doing poorly in the world, economically, military. And so keeping them informed and uh, getting them prepared to uh, take positive necessary action in the um, when it's needed, uh, I think it's very important to keep you know engaging with them. And you so are that, interpret- I think is a, the one role that Japan can no, and- play and should be playing. Just a, a clarifying question. Why do you interpret China's economy as going through a lot of troubles because of the instabilities? Because it's already the largest economy in the world in purchasing power parity terms. Um, so it has has had a phenomenal rise, right? But what 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 do you think is a, is problematic to the Chinese? Well, I mean, China is uh, losing the, the markets in the U.S. Uh, we are, you know, can different countries are, uh, you know, the de- risking uh, China, right? And uh, uh, sort of isolate, not entirely, but uh, isolating China from the international supply chain, economic supply chain. And, uh, you know, why is China kind of coming to Japan and, you know, telling us to, you know, cooperate more closely together? Our interpretation is uh, they are in trouble. They understand it. They need uh, more cooperation, more interactions, positive interactions with them, uh, with us. But, you know, so they are trying to do it. But on the other hand, you know, those more kind of hardline forces in China are dragging, keep dragging China into a negative competitive direction. And we are torn between those two forces and we are seeing those two forces operating at the same time. And uh, so we try our best to discourage. I mean, so I, I'm saying, I, I would say what the US and Japan is doing in, you know, um, strengthen our defense capabilities and strengthening our deterrence vis-a-vis China is in China's national interest because we are uh, trying to prevent crazy hardliners in China from coming out and say, look, Japan, the US, they are weak and uh, we have a capability to take Taiwan by force. That, you know, if China attacked Taiwan, that would be disastrous, not only to us, but to China. So I think uh, we, our effort, what we are doing, uh, actually helping China and I think uh, uh, Chinese intellectuals, uh, you know, moderate, peace-loving uh, intellectuals understand that. And the one, the the only thing that I can think at the moment that could really or would necessarily trigger a Chinese invasion of Taiwan would be a Taiwanese declaration of independence. Is Japan trying to discourage Taiwan from going there? Um, what's how how is Japan trying to interact with the Republic of China, so the government of Taiwan? Um, I think, I mean, chat, it's a sort of a, a consensus, consensus in Taiwan that they would not declare independence. I mean, they don't have to because they are, you know, as a practical matter, almost independent, right? And why, why bother? Why give a China an excuse to attack Taiwan, right? So, um, so to me, I mean, we are... Uh, somewhat uh, concerned about a possibility, which we are not seeing at this point, uh, that uh, in the, you know, kind of uh, a somewhat uh, extreme political uh, forces emerging in China uh, and kind of saying that, uh, you know, 
we should uh, declare independence in, in Taiwan. Yeah, in Taiwan. Uh, but I am not seeing that, so I'm not too concerned about that at this point. Okay, then maybe a last set of questions. Um, the NATO summit is going to happen this weekend in uh, in Washington, and uh, Japan, South Korea are invited to it. And there's going to be a liaison office, uh, or did it already open, or it's going to open in Tokyo? Um, is is NATO expansion to to the Pacific something that you think will happen, and is it something that you think would be uh, stabilizing or destabilizing? I think it's uh, certainly uh, stabilizing and it's uh, going to be a help um, because of um, two or three reasons. One, uh, it's going to be a you know symbolically very important step uh, that uh, the countries in the world, I mean, you know, these uh, democratic, uh, peace-loving nations standing together uh, to say no to expansion of uh, authoritarian, aggressive forces uh, rising in uh, Europe as well as in, in Asia. So symbolic value is significant. And also uh, there are areas in which we can really, as a practical matter, cooperate, uh, uh, which is you know, operational cooperation. Uh, German, Germany is sending its uh, fighters to Japan, uh, you know, the UK, uh, the Netherlands, uh, France sent its forces to Japan to work with us. They might not uh, be able to send large, you know, kind of uh, combat forces in case of war across the Taiwan Strait, but certainly their help would be welcome. And also what's uh, uh, emerging right now is a global uh, um, kind of network of cooperation on defense industrial capacity building. Uh, because now what we, you know, uh, re from the, we are learning lessons from the war in Ukraine, which is, you know, the Western countries simply do not have enough capacity to produce arms, necessary ammunition, missiles, and other things. So now we are gearing up uh, and uh, saying, okay, uh, individual countries, uh, we have to um, increase our capacity, strengthen our capacity, individual uh, capacity to build, produce more arms. And uh, we have to build a global network uh, with which if there is something bad, uh, you know, uh, in Europe, happening in Europe, uh, those countries outside Europe will be able to help them. Uh, and uh, if there is something bad happening in uh, in Asia, then other countries, Europe, in Europe, the US and other countries can help us in Asia. So that's the new sort of a global network that we are trying to build. And the NATO countries are important, uh, you know, the indispensable part of it. Aren't you worried that this is cr might create a pre-First World War situation in which different alliances that then interlock and a tiny little spark somewhere might trigger a world war. And, you know, that the alliance system that's being expanded actually then traps Japan into certain uh, responsibilities. And second question, isn't that actually enhancing the security dilemma on the other side, on the Chinese and maybe also Russian and North Korean side, who will perceive this as an, as an, as a gearing up against them isn't that isn't that negative all overall for what's happening? Um, I don't have any concern about it. I have uh, some uh, concerns about uh, the possible emergence of uh, security dilemma on the Korean Peninsula, because North Korea and South Korea are just so close to each other, right? Armed with uh, both of them, armed with a uh, very offensively uh, offensive um, systems, weapon systems. So there, there can be a, a security dilemma. But uh, Taiwan Strait is, you know, we got lucky. Taiwan is an island nation. You know, China cannot, I mean, Taiwan, we cannot preempt China. That's a, you know, joke. China can, will not be able to preempt us easily because of the sea, right? And uh, so certainly we are concerned about, um, you know, a large number of missiles that uh, China is deploying. Uh, currently, China has a 1,000 
uh, short range ballistic missiles targeted at Taiwan, and some of them are targeted at Okinawa, and another 1,000 uh, medium range ballistic missiles targeted uh, capable of reaching Japan mainland. But, you know, they cannot just um, preempt us entirely effectively. So we are not concerned about getting preempted and uh, we lose everything. And, and another thing is certainly Japan is uh, acquiring, um, started to acquire strike capabilities, but you know, what we are uh, acquiring, they are cruise missiles basically. Cruise missiles are very slow. We cannot preempt China with those missiles. And, uh, you know, with the current, you know, um, very high tech uh, sensors and all that, radars, it's, you know, it's very difficult. We are not living in the 19th century or 20, early 20th century where uh, detecting um, the mobiliz mobilization of your en enemy was quite difficult. I mean, we will understand, we will not be uh, preempted easily, and uh, so we can be relaxed. And, you know, who would like to start a war against China? I mean, Chinese knows that. Yeah, so what you're saying is that preempting means you uh, China cannot shoot down all of your assets first, and you cannot shoot down all of their assets first, so you know that strike and second strike capabilities are given. Therefore, overall, you, you, you would say it's still a stable environment military yeah, so speaking. there's no no security dilemma between china and, and taiwan and i mean you know nobody you know even chinese are not saying that they are worried about our preemptive strikes mm. i mean north koreans are actually saying that and that they, it, they it, there is an you know point uh, in that, because South Korea has, as I said, a tremendous strike uh, offensive capabilities by now. So, I mean, certainly South Koreans are acquiring those offensive capabilities for, you know, defensive purposes. But from the North Korean, you know, perspective, certainly they have some, uh, you know, kind of, um, it's only natural for, the, for them to have some concerns. Okay, so we are nearing the end. If we have to summarize what you said, you would say like North, uh, Northeast Asia, Pacific, Asia Pacific. Overall, pro there are problems, but overall, still stable at the moment. Um, I didn't go that far. <laughs> um, you know, as I said, I mean, North Korea is uh, getting becoming more off on the offensive. I mean, on the defensive. Um, but then. Uh, they might use offensive means of fending off mm. uh, the pressure coming from South Korea, uh, you know. And uh, although China is now talking about uh, cooperation, uh, but at the same time, China keeps building up its own uh, defense. I mean, military capabilities, uh, you know, uh, and to attack um, Taiwan. Xi Jinping has. Uh, instructed it's uh, his uh, uh, military, the People's uh, Liberation Army, to get ready to attack Taiwan, take Taiwan by force by 2027. I don't know whether they can actually do it, but uh, that's the instruction. So um, we have definitely some concerns, and uh, that's why um, the US, Japan, and Australia, South Korea, and other countries in the Indo-Pacific region, in the, uh, the Philippines, are doing their best to maintain the balance of power here. Is there an order to take Taiwan by 2027? I thought the, the speech was reunification by 2049. Uh, no, no, um, that's a separate. So Kim, uh, Xi Jinping um, told the PLA to be ready, whatever it means, to uh, take Taiwan by force uh, by 2027. Okay. Well, I mean, that, that sounds that sounds less happy. I was hoping mean? I was hoping to end on a happy note, but um, maybe we just leave it as it what it is. Um, Professor Narushiga Michishita, where can people follow you if they want to follow your writing and and publications? Oh, I have an account on X. Oh. And so if you can follow me on X, uh, that would be the best way to follow my works. Okay. 
I include uh, Professor right. Michishta's uh, X link in the description of this video. Professor, thank Great. you very much for your time today. Thank you very much, and nice talking to you, Pascal. Thank you.